The 90s were a CD time, CD music, CD films, and then came the games. So many CD games. Some would even call them Mega CD. Thanks to Sega, we had the first truly successful CD-based console, and in this current environment I have seen most class it as a failure. Historic revisionism is a real thing, it seems. I covered this before with the great Atari video game Crash of 1983. This and other info is presented as fact, largely it seems by those not even born or aware of that time. Nintendo never saved the games industry, it was alive and well all along, and the Mega CD was not a failure, instead it was a pioneer during a special time. So let's get down and CD. Now, if rumours are to be believed, well, numbers released anyway, then the Mega CD or Sega CD in the US sold approximately 2.5 million units, give or take 100k here or there. A circa 10% attach rate is not to be hand waved away and would class as a decent game sale figure now, let alone then. To put this into perspective, this is almost as many Master Systems sold in Japan and the US combined, a console which led to its conquering sequel. It is a higher attach rate than the PSVR even. The Mega CD was not the first CD-ROM console or add-on to be released. That fell to its bitter rival in the PC Engine, which beat its release by three years at the end of 1988. The Japanese release of this CD augment, a Mega Drive trait, in 1991 managed to secure a decent uptake. Comparatively, with the PC Engine being the clear number one console at the time in its home territory. Luckily, it was a very different story in other parts of the world, with the Mega being number one for many years and retaining it in many parts of Europe and Brazil. This helped it secure a much bigger footprint for CD gaming and was the first taste of CD games for many Western audiences and by far the most mainstream. The later CD32 and 3DO and even full PC CD-ROM were a few years after, with the CDI and CDTV far from successes. All things considered, the Mega CD in relation to its peers, condition of the market and emergence of the format for games, it was not only successful, but was forging the path for many to follow. The hardware itself was actually quite cutting edge. I remember obsessing about all of this storage, sound and graphical boost it would offer alongside bigger and better games. Taking a deeper look into my very own day one purchase unit I still own here, we can get under the skin of just what powers it. A privilege, as I've never actually opened this unit at all until today, so I'm voiding my warranty for you peeps here. But look, just keep it between us, okay? Don't tell Sega. So, this is the Mega Drive. Obviously the 32X, the Mega Drive itself, and then the Mega CD underneath, which is what we're interested on this video. Sliding it out of the way, we can see that underneath it's one solid unit. The unit itself has its own power supply, I've already taken the screws out here to save myself some time, but essentially the whole thing slides out of place like this, pops up, and then you slide the side off and the cover goes there. I've taken the screws out of the heat shield plates, they just slide off, and then inside you have the ribbon cable, Please make sure you take time to do this, the cable itself the actual the CD-ROM left the game in there and then you've got your power PCB board at the back with your sound audio connections so your audio jacks your single connection which loops into your Mega Drive or your Genesis and the power supply there but the main heart of the system is here this this is the heart of everything so the actual PCB board you've got your main ribbon cables that go off to the PCB board at the back with the power and the sound and then you've got the one that connects straight to the CD-ROM itself. And then at the back you've got your main Sega BIOS, your EEPROM there, that's the, the uh, UK BIOS or the PAL BIOS. You've got your 6 megabits of VRAM along the edge there. This is your PCM sound processor so the Mega CD could process its own sound in addition to obviously red book audio and yellow book data. And then you've got your additional connections. So right here, this is your CD-ROM host adapter for error. So this is the communication between the, the both the data point, the CPU, and the CD-ROM that handles your that handles your host adapter, your connections between the two. And then you've got your main 68,000 CPU. Now this is actually faster 
than the one in the Mega Drive. It's clocked at 12.5 megahertz. And then you've got your DSP, which is your GPU essentially. And this was the chip that offered you things like sprite scaling rotation, which wasn't possible outside of arcades. Remember, this launched after the Sega or the Super Nintendo, and that was essentially what they were trying to do to make sure that this could compete with the Super Nintendo at the time by delivering scaling and rotation. But there were some limitations in how this worked. But essentially the whole thing was a slave or a secondary CPU to the main CPU on the Mega Drive and everything ran through the data ribbon straight through and into your connection here on the bottom of the Mega Drive. And that's how the whole thing daisy chained together and all of this chip worked in tandem with the Mega Drive to deliver the visuals that we see in the final games. But unfortunately there were limitations in how this all fitted together which we'll cover in a little more detail now. Now that we've covered the hardware physically, unlike the 32X add-on, the Mega CD had no direct video output. It could create its own bitmap graphics and enhance the quality of the Mega Drive, but everything it created had to be shifted across to the Mega Drive's RAM and VDP4 display, meaning palettes, on-screen colours, scrolling planes or sprite limits were unchanged. It did not mean that games could not look much better or deliver beyond what the base console could though. Simply the work was more involved than a mere port. It is said that late into the dev cycle due to the PC Engine CD it had a RAM boost from 2 to 6 megabits. This block of RAM is split up into two main chunks. 512 kilobytes or 4 megabits is dedicated to the program RAM for the sub CPU of the Mega CD and then 256 kilobytes or 2 megabits of Word RAM which is used to store and transfer data from the CD unit or created through code from the sub CPU or DSP over to the main CPU and into VRAM for display via the VDP of the Mega Drive. Now, in theory, the main CPU can access this RAM directly, but due to the construction and IRQ, the sub-CPU needs to wait when this happens. To balance this, the word RAM has two modes of operation. 1M1M. Now, this mode splits the 256 kilobytes into two chunks, likely 128 kilobytes each. It allows the main and sub CPU to have a scratch pad each and work in parallel and copy between as needed, which best utilizes the dual CPU architecture. The full screen bitmap display function of the Mega CD can only work in this mode. It maps to a 16x16 16 16 or 32x32 32 32 pixel or dot map and is ideal for the full screen animation that the console did so well and allowed 15 FPS FMV or animations to run. Now this allows the sub CPU to pull data from RAM while the main CPU of the Mega Drive displays the current data. The same limits apply on VDP from the console and due to the lack of sprite data also reduces colours to 32. Now the 2M mode here, the word RAM is dedicated to each CPU and one needs to store while the other reads or writes here. This is the only mode in which the Mega CD can enhance the visuals with its scaling and rotation effects. Due to the chip's ability and mapping to word RAM, this happens in this block. It is then converted by the coordinate method that alters the starting point of the core image or sprite and then maps to the standard raster method of the screen left to right. By altering the X value size per line, the image can scale or tilt, creating a 3D effect. This is how the mode 7 effect works on the Super Nintendo and how the road scaling works here on Batman. Each of these modes require the DSP but are exclusive to each other in that a game could only you do one or the other and not both at the same time. This powerful but limited ability of the Mega CD made it yet another Sega console that really expected low level coding skills. The BIOS does very little aside handle the LED prompts and CD access, beyond this everything else was up to the programmer to create and resolve. The SIB CPU also has to control the request to the CD-ROM as well. It's no surprise that many of the best uses of the tech came from teams used to this and Europe was always better at this non-API level than most due to its huge demo scene of the time on the Amiga ST at L. Now core design was one of the standouts on the console and largely show the absolute best you can get from it. Technically it was a good upgrade that offered enhanced graphics, video options, CD soundtracks and 8 channel PCM sampling which was used extensively in games for music, dialogue and effects as using the CD itself greatly limited the other functions if you dedicated the access and 64kb block of RAM to keep this fed. 
Now, I bought all the magazines at the time, Mega, CVG, Meme Machines, even imports from Electronic Gaming Monthly and GamePro, as I am or was an info fiend back then. This carry over into import of games, and I already owned a Mega Drive from Japan before it even launched in the UK. As such, the option to import a Mega CD was real, real expensive. I managed to play my first game on the format in 1992 during one of my many trips to Telegames, a local import store in my area. Now, Soul Feast may not look like much now, but actually took advantage of the new format well. Essentially, an enhanced port, this used the CD medium to deliver crystal clear speech on the intro and Red Book soundtrack. Even then I noticed this and wanted one even for my Mega Drive. You must remember that hearing long and high quality voice work in games was a true revelation alongside full orchestral soundtracks. It would be another year before it landed in the UK and I got mine, but the true impact it made to me in gaming was yet to be felt. That first 12 months in Japan and later the US, rebranded again as the Sega CD, was growing a small collection of games and studios, moving up to CD development, still trying to understand and how best to utilize the medium. The biggest impact it ushered in and is almost squarely laid at the Mega CD's feet is FMV games. The fact that this is not entirely true though, many of the big hits on it were instead created for an unreleased console set to launch in 1989, but cancelled by Hasbro. The Nemo was a VHS based console that would use real footage to play an interactive movie. Digital Pictures picked up the rights via the producer Tom Zito, this was his own company, and was passed around until Sega picked it up for release on the Sega CD some five years after it was filmed in 1992. Some extra footage was shot with a SCAT team segments but that was all a bit crap really. It also was a game that used sampled speech instead of streaming it all with the video data for numerous reasons but I cover this in my other game videos. It not only stands as the very first FMV based game and interactive movie to launch but also played a huge role in the ushering in of video games rating boards. A Senate hearing was covered at length in the US alongside Mortal Kombat and the infamous bathroom scene you see here was the vital piece that the entire issue hung on. Now the UK was the same with tabloids picking up on teenager girl half naked and tortured in a bathroom, his latest video game shocker. The outcome was this poor and rather tedious game gained so much media attention it became taboo which means people wanted it. It went on to sell almost 500,000 copies and I still own my 1993 version here which is the full uncut one. A later re-release was put out after Sega decided to distance itself from it without the scat footage contained and the new rating in the US. Here in the UK it was a 15, which only enticed us teenagers even more. What are you doing? Now, Sewer Shark was another big budget title designed for the control vision that jumped ship. It actually cost more to make and was directed by ILM guru John Dykstra, who had crafted many of the most iconic model space battle sequences from the original Star Wars saga. It was literally an on-rail shooter with a crosshair and pixels to shoot while choosing a direction from 4 in QTE style. The push on the pre-launch VHS tape in the UK made this one to watch and all the video quality was poor and suffered terrible colour banding and stippling. It was at least very smooth relatively. Much of the blame can be laid at the cheap consumer grade single speed laser pickup the console had. Costs had increased due to that 6 megabits of RAM, A6 and casing, meaning the optics suffered. which means means corners were cut on video quality, not because the hardware could not do better, but because it simply was impossible at the time to achieve a better result from the compression methods available. If only the N64 Resident Evil 2 team had been around, ironically, the Mega Drive can deliver better quality FMV at much shorter stints due to the cartridge format not being hamstrung like this. 
It did offer much more than just movies though. Arcade ports and console ports with enhancements also stood out for the upgrade. One of the biggest pushes came from its desire to upstage the Super Nintendo and as such, the DSP enabled hardware accelerated sprites and background scaling and rotation. This of course got overused at times. As I covered earlier, this method of cooperative display work limited the frame rate, meaning most of these games ran at 17 or 20 FPS. This true hardware accelerated scaling rotation was not used as often as it could have been. This largely stemmed, I feel, from the difficulty in achieving it and the mixed processes of Sega's divisions at the time. The enhanced Batman Returns was a great demo of it and really looked like an arcade game at the time, being much more enjoyable than the bland and poorly designed platform sections from the Mega Drive base. Now many games on this console are actually worth and I dive into the best and the worst that the machine offered up next week and some real gems and brand new games at times that the console received and how they differed from other versions. Please check my channel next week for that and be sure not to miss it by hitting that subscribe and notification bell so you can enjoy another Sunday morning retro escapade. When I picked up my Mega CD from hard work trying to pay for it all, I was never sad by what I enjoyed. Sure, some games did not live up to the hype, but it felt cutting edge to be playing a real video as a game. Scaling graphics like an arcade machine and feeding it all out using my RC leads into my Sony amp and mission speakers. It really felt like the next level. If you were a better junker than that, Jean... Sean wouldn't have had to die out there. But that's it for now and this quick look and dive into the Mega CD augment, the hardware that powered it and just what Sega decided to deliver back in those early days of CD augments and trying to keep that lifespan of the Mega Drive as long as they possibly could. I'll catch you next week with yet more Sega love. I'll see you on the next one. I put the lives of those girls in your hands and you screwed up. I'm pulling the plug on you before you do any more damage.